day, beginning a 12 year, 4 billion mile journey for Lucy. Absolutely. 159. Vehicle internal. 155. Launch sequencer start. 150. Securing Centaur LH2. Securing Centaur LO2. 140. Launch enabled. 137. FTS armed. 90 seconds to go. One twenty. OC is armed. SCS count started. One ten. Vent valves locked. One minute. Rock, report range status. Range screen. All right, so stay with us again after liftoff. Uh, we'll also have the voice chiming in from uh, Rob Kesselman from ULA. Uh, he'll be providing the launch vehicle ascent data. Forty. Stable at step three. So that's a great uh, sign right there, stable at step three. Everything is at flight pressures. We're now the only thing left, Joshua, is that final status check uh, with the whole team. 25 seconds. Status check. Go Atlas. Go Centaur. Go Lucy. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Lift off. Atlas V takes flight sending Lucy to uncover the fossils of our solar system. Tower clear. Okay, 180 propellant utilization has gone to close loop control. The vehicle has begun the pitch yaw roll maneuver. Now, 30 seconds into flight, Vehicle is 0.6 miles in altitude, traveling at 939 miles per hour. Body 180 performance continues to look good at this time. Engine pump speeds and injector pressures are in family for this thrust level. Vehicle attitude remains stable at this time. Attitude rates are near zero in all, in all axes. Now at T plus 70 seconds into flight, vehicle is four miles in altitude, 0.2 miles downrange distance, traveling at 1,200 miles per hour. Mark 1, Atlas is now supersonic. Vehicle is now passing through max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. The vehicle is now throttling down slightly. Body 180 engine parameters continue to look nominal after the prior adjustment to the thrust level. Only two minutes remain in the Atlas booster phase of flight. The Atlas V rocket weighs now just one half of what it did at launch, burning propellant at a rate of 2,600 pounds per second. Vehicle is now executing closed loop steering. Center 5 Central Reaction Control System is now pressurizing the flight levels. So beautiful launch sequence there. Uh, we do have uh, another minute and a half or so to go with the booster in operation, uh, getting 
Uh, Lucy. We're now just under three minutes into flight. Atlas is 33 miles in altitude, 59 miles downrange distance, traveling at 5,600 miles per hour. So Lucy being lifted up out of the atmosphere by the booster, getting on its way into a park orbit uh, before we get towards... Uh, All first stage vehicle systems are operating as expected at this time. Future, uh, future portions of the launch activity, we have the, the Centaur multiple burns ahead and spacecraft separation. And the big milestone we should see Josh coming up is booster engine cutoff, which would be the first stage cutoff and then stage The main separation. engine is now throttling to maintain a constant 5G acceleration limit. We're going to see a few things happen pretty rapidly. The, the booster will cut off just after four minutes. And then within the next 15 seconds after that, we should see the Atlas separate from the Centaur and then the Centaur engine ignite for its first burn. Centaur has begun the boost phase chill down sequence. And the RD-180 is now throttling to maintain a constant 4.6 G acceleration limit. Boost phase chill down sequence has completed. And we have Pico booster engine cutoff and a successful stage separation event. So what you're seeing on screen is an animation that's being driven by actual telemetry. Please on the RL-10. So we are watching these things uh, in an animation happen here, but they're happening in real time as well. And with that's one. We have ignition for the first burn. All right, so there we go. Uh, we should see the, fair, the fairing jettison here. We have indication of good payload fairing jettison. And there we go. All right, Nick, so that wraps up the, the first round of, of major milestones here. Uh, still very much in the middle of dynamic flight. The uh, system on the RL-10 is now in an open loop burn-off mode to burn off excess fuel in the early portion of this burn. So walk us quickly through, Mick. What are we looking for uh, in the next, in this burn and the next one? So this burn is going to end with uh, Miko uh, getting uh, Centaur and Lucy into its park orbit around Earth. And then we will then get into MESS-2, which will get us into that transfer orbit, getting Lucy on its way. Awesome. So that's going to do it for now, uh, finishing up the initial launch activities. Everything sounding like it's going perfectly. Uh, Daryl, back to you. Thank you, Joshua and Mick. A beautiful launch out here from our vantage point. Incredible. All right. Lucy was built at the Lockheed Martin facility in Colorado before arriving at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station for launch. Engineers at Lockheed's Waterton facility use lessons learned from prior spacecraft like New Horizons and OSIRIS-REx to build Lucy. And in July, Lucy was packed up and flown on board a United States Air Force C-17 cargo plane from Colorado to the launch and landing facility runway at the Kennedy Space Center. From there, Lucy was transported to an Astrotech Space Operations Processing Facility in nearby Titusville for final preparations before liftoff. Yeah, just a few miles from here before it was brought to the pad. For more about how Lucy was built, let's send it over to NASA's Megan Cruz. Hey, Daryl. Yeah, right now I'm joined by Ari Vogel. He's the Deep Space Exploration Director at Lockheed Martin Space. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Thanks so much for having me. Wasn't that just a beautiful launch? What did you think about that? Incredible. You know, seeing it go over the clouds and bright up, brighten up the whole sky was just fantastic. Yeah, to see it rise over the clouds, because, you know, we lost it a little bit because of some cloud coverage, but then it just rose out of it. It was so beautiful. And, yeah. you know, I really wanted to talk to you because you, your team at Lockheed Martin Space knew that you were going into a project that would require require you to develop a spacecraft that would travel farther than any other solar powered spacecraft yeah. ever. I mean, was that intimidating? You know, it was a, it was a really exciting challenge to, to solve, right? And obviously, the most prominent feature of Lucy is their big solar arrays. Each one is about the length of a bus. And, um, you know, what we did is we basically just broke the problem down into smaller pieces and then applied systems thinking to make sure that the design trades we were doing uh, didn't impact or that we fully understood the impacts for over the 12-year mission. So, you know, being the farthest uh, solar-powered spacecraft is certainly something that was difficult to prepare for, um, as is going to a record eight asteroids in one mission. Uh, but that's why we have such a comprehensive Test Like You Fly program at Lockheed Martin, and we took it through the ringer at our facility in Denver. Yeah, and you did it all within 14 months. That's during a pandemic. That's incredible. Can you talk to me about the challenges of that? Yeah, you know, it's it's really awe-inspiring. I mean, to, to be able to to build a one-of-a-kind one spacecraft during normal circumstances is incredible. And the team just really pulled together, didn't miss a beat, connected and collaborated, you know, made sure that we didn't, uh, didn't 
have any mistakes. And it really accelerated some of our digital transformation initiatives too, having to, to work during the pandemic. And not a single shift was missed during integration and test due wow. to COVID. So team just did an awesome job, leadership with the preparation and the over communication and the transparency. And then all the team, you know, just didn't let their commitment to, to Lucy waver. And I think the thing that I'm most proud about actually is, is that through it all, we still continue to all of our STEM events, all our mentoring, our coaching, uh, Lockheed Martin, NASA, Southwest Research in Institute, hundreds of thousands of hours in, into that. So it was really, really a great job. And really quick, you also built the antenna that's on there that's going to help us communicate with Lucy. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, we did. A uh, six and a half foot uh, wide antenna that, that we built. Main job is to is to do the communication between the spacecraft. And, um, you know, it's also going to send back some of the first images of the Trojans. So I the whole team is super excited yeah, for that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank yeah. you so much, Ari. I really appreciate you being here today so and much. for bringing Lucy to life. So thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, Daryl, back to you. All right, thank you, Megan. And in case you're just joining us, we here at uh, NASA are at the beginning of Lucy's 530-mile journey to the Trojan asteroids beyond the sun, going to the same orbit, Marie, as Jupiter. That's right. It was a beautiful launch here. We could see it light up the water behind us, and we actually had a gator in the water just behind us. Oh, <laughs> joining us too. for lift off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, jo Lucy is named after a skeleton fossil more than 3 million years old. Lucy was an early early human ancestor, and the Trojan asteroids are fossils, too, of how planets were formed. Beyond the asteroid belt are fossils of planet formation, known as the Trojan asteroids. These primitive bodies share Jupiter's orbit in two vast swarms, leading and trailing the planet. Now. NASA is preparing to visit seven asteroids. Embarking on a 12-year odyssey that will span Jupiter's orbit. One mission will explore these objects for the first time. Lucy the first mission to the Trojan asteroids. And uh, another special guest that we had watching the launch from the Atlas Space Flight Operations Center was none, on our, none other than uh, NASA's Associate Administrator, Bob Cabana. He is standing by with uh, Blair Allen of NASA EDGE. Um, actually, uh, they're telling me that we lost audio uh, with that group, so we will we will come back to that um, if we can, but uh, while they try to work out their audio issues, but Daryl, uh, you know, we had we had a really unmatched view of of launch here. It was just spectacular. Yeah, it was incredible because uh, we're sitting. You can't really tell, but this behind us is the Kennedy Basin, right. the Turn Basin, where they brought in, uh, you know, the space shuttle uh, main uh, tank, mm -hmm. as well as just recently uh, the core stage for the Artemis rocket, which is in uh, the VAB right now getting stacked. You're looking at the flight of Centaur and Lucy. We are L plus 11 minutes and 26 seconds as we cruise along. And we want to talk a little bit now about the message that Lucy is going to be sending. That's right. Uh, Lucy is carrying something on board. Um, aside from her scientific instruments, she's got something a little more philosophical. There is actually a plaque affixed to the side of the Lucy spacecraft, and it contains quotes and messages from artists, poets, and thought leaders. And the plaque is meant to serve as a time capsule of sorts for our own descendants. You see, after Lucy's 12-year mission is complete, the spacecraft will remain on a stable orbit, traveling back and forth between the Earth and the Trojan asteroids for perhaps hundreds of thousands of years. And one day in the distant future, our descendants may be able to retrieve Lucy. Uh, there it is, this, the uh, the plaque you can see on the mm. side of the spacecraft. Wow. This was uh, before uh, Lucy was packed inside the payload fairing. Uh, but this is meant to be uh, a relic for our and for our descendants uh, of the early days of humanity's exploration of the solar system. Uh, and when they do, they will see some great messages. We'll see those. Uh, we'll talk more about those in just a couple of minutes. We um, oh, we actually yeah. have. We do have it. Yeah. Um, so this is um, a representation. It's hidden a little bit behind your computer, Daryl. Oh, yeah. Um, let me get that down. <laughs> 
Thank you. But this is the actual plaque on the spacecraft is about a tenth of the size of this, so this is blown up. Yeah. Um, but it's got um, a diagram on it. This shows the positions of the planets as they are today on the day of the Lucy launch. That's right, and there are some great quotes. You mentioned some of the great philosophers and uh, thought leaders over time. Down at the bottom left, you can see uh, that one there is from Albert Einstein. The important thing is to never stop questioning. And then in the middle, we've got uh, the Beatles. In fact, every single Beatle four, is yep. here, including John Lennon. And he says, we'll all shine on like the moon and the stars and the sun. And then up here at the top, um, actually right here on the far right, we've got mm -hmm. Amanda Gorman, who just came to recent fame at the presidential inauguration. And she actually wrote this poem specifically for Lucy. And there's a great quote in here. She says, hope implores us, may ancient, um, the ancient study and the uncompromising core of us to keep rising for an earth more than worth fighting for. Her, Great she, words yeah, from a is, young poet. Yeah, she's a she's an amazing poet. Just blows me away. Uh, we are going to uh, now get a look at uh, some more of the messages uh, that we intend to leave behind for our descendants. Take a look.